Welcome to We're Not Wizards. We are the best, but not wizards. Enjoy the show! Welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for July. And as Jack Nicholson's character in The Batman said, come on, or festival. Because today I don't want you to be kind of middle line. It's, you know, we're approaching Friday, so everybody should be a bit more happier. So I want to get rid of the gloom. I want you to be cheery. I want you to enjoy this festival. And what a festival lineup have we got? Because if you're going to be talking festival, there's only one festival we can talk about. And that is the Gloomhaven Festival. And there's only one person we can bring on to talk about the festival. And this is the second... This is like the second episode. This is like the second time. So he's officially a repeat offender from Seth LaFair. I've got Ross Thompson. Yay! What's up? <laughs> How are you doing? Are you good? Are you- I'm doing good. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's full it's full campaign mode, right? So you're getting you're getting somebody who's like crispy <laughs> off three weeks of campaign with uh with uh six days still to go, right? So well, we, uh, we never a dull moment here. We kind of we kind of spoken about let's do something at the beginning, but I know you've got people who you speak to who are far more interesting than me and far more popular than me. Oh, and I haven't even been doing any front facing stuff. I've had Isaac go on everything, man. Really? So, oh yeah, no one wants to hear from me for for Gloomhaven. <laughs> I'm, I, that's not. It's they want to hear from Isaac. They want to hear from the design team. That's the what. That's the whole point of this show, right? So, <laughs> it's good. So, like when we first last time we spoke there was the kind of you were kind of doing the bridging bit between kind of steamforge and i think cephalofair wasn't i don't i can't remember off the top of my head if it was kind of like all it was it was official you kind of moved over but i think so yeah but now that you're right in the middle of it because <laughs> it's almost like isaac did you like design this campaign to kind of like give me a full kind of baptism of fire um is it is it a huge is it a huge difference from say the the crowdfunding you were doing it like you'd done it kind of like Steamforge is it a big departure? So at a certain point, all crowdfunding is the same, right? Right? Like there's here's a product, here's a thing, you're back mm-hmm. it, you're not going to get it till whenever, right? Yeah. Um, this campaign is infinitely different from anything I've worked on in like the twelve years I've been doing crowdfunding. Okay. Um, and what's neat about it, there's a couple things that are really neat about it, right? Mm-hmm. One is that the Gloomhaven audience is a excitable, awesome, passionate fan base, yeah. right? So like they, they know what Gloomhaven is. They've played it. They're deep in that. Mm-hmm. They've done Jaws the Lion. They, they've followed Isaac for forever, right? They all have, they all have Frosthaven right now and they're all getting their teeth deep into that, right? So they want to know what's next. Yeah, yeah. And, uh. At a certain point, we know that wherever we go, they'll be on board and they want to be a part of that because they want to be a part of the Gloomhaven journey with Isaac, Mm -hmm. right? So um, that was a a cool base to start from and being able to essentially be like, hey, cool, we've got all these things we want to do. We want to do second edition. We want to do the role playing game. We want to do the miniatures. We want to do Frosthaven second printing. We want to do buttons and bugs, which we got to announce, right? And then when I add in all these apps and uh, accessories and things and all of that. And so Isaac's goal when he brought me on back in January was to be like, okay, I want to have this all in one campaign, wow. which um, I was like, okay, well, okay. that's that's a thing. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know if I would have done that originally, even I, 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 looking at it now, I'm so glad we did it. It's awesome. Right. But it's one of those things where I was like, okay, that's new. And he's like, yep, I want to do things that are new and, and ambitious. And and we did. So essentially it was putting together that campaign and how do we make it that level of uh, of this. And so 
uh, one of the how the festival name came around was uh, trying to figure out how do you name something in a campaign that isn't the one product? Because normally if you're funding for a board game, yeah. it's just the name, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? And all of that. And we're like, well, we couldn't call it uh, Gloomhaven Second Edition Role Playing Game Miniatures <laughs> Campaign because on backer kit, right? Because so that's that's just a mouthful and all of that. So yeah, the festival idea really kind of came around, which then really helped the thematic side of stuff, right? Because the Frosthaven campaign they had was in the desolate region of Frosthaven and the campaign page itself mm. was icy and this, and uh, we were all doing quarantine and everything there. So it could totally fit that like, Oh, we're all isolated and this stuff. And, yeah. and there hadn't been anything new. So people were excited to dive deep on that. And so coming into this one, it was cool. Let's celebrate Gloomhaven, right? We're going to be in the city. Let's have banners. Let's have confetti. Let's have this stuff. Let's have, all of this. And then a big thing Isaac really wanted was the Gloomhaven TV thing, right? And everything there. And so he was like, I want, I want TV. And I'm like, great, let's, let's put it together. Yeah. Right. And there's some things I don't want to go like on, like deep on the, all on that, but things change on Twitch, things change on YouTube, backer kit, wanted to do all these things. So we had to figure out the best way to have that happen. And so it's really cool that we're able to showcase all of our stuff live on the backer kit page which is really neat like that isn't a thing that kickstarter does or any other crowdfunding platform does so being able to have like like right now as we're recording you know we have one of our uh the video game partners on right now yeah and they're showing off the trailer for the thing and doing all of that and we've got you know 200 viewers that are watching that live on twitch and the backer kit page that's pretty cool you know and we've been able to do all this content i think we've been at like you know, um, I I think I did the count last week. It was like, you know, 60 hours of stuff and and or 60 different shows with like, you know, X amount. And it's been crazy, right? So, but, but, but it's been neat because we've been able to kind of keep it fresh because we have to showcase stuff for 2.0, for the role-playing game, for miniatures, yeah, for everything else. Yeah, yeah. And how do you keep it in a way that people want to come back each day or at least give them something to do and do all that? Yeah. And so it's been an interesting way to, uh, there's a lot of noise, that's for sure, right? But it's like, how do you break it in a way? So we like on our, on our daily updates, um, that has character previews. It's mm, got yeah. uh, live stream updates. It's got puzzle breakdowns. It's got uh, recaps. It's got these things, all this kind of stuff. And so... They're fairly bite-sized yeah. though, aren't they? Because I remember, mm-hmm. I mean, anybody that's kind of backed kind of Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, any of those games, you know, will notice that when Isaac has traditionally done, like, the Seth Lafayre newsletter, that he writes, the boy pens. <laughs> he likes to tell you everything that's kind oh, of going on. he does. You know. It's great. It, oh, yeah. Are, are we approaching, or have we now crossed the threshold where Gloomhaven is kind of like a brand? Because you're, oh, you're, you're talking to me like 100%. video games... I mean, everybody's talking about, the, you know, the video game and how it compares to the actual board game. You've now, you know, you've got your various iterations of Gloomhaven, you've got your Jaws of the Lion, so you've got your intro kind of thing. And then you've got kind of like the RPG, which is a huge big step into a big world as well. That's, to me, right, okay, to me, releasing a board game and marketing a board game it's kind of like if you've got enough joie de vivre about you and enough things to differentiate you, you can you can find your audience and you can do quite well. Entering the tabletop RPG space, that's... Even a big names can go there to, to kind of effectively kind of flounder and, and have difficulty. So was, was is the RPG stuff, is that... Is that something that's still kind of getting worked on, looked at, tinkered with? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's, uh, well, Isaac is, is, he would say that he's probably like a role play game guy, gamer at heart. Mm-hmm. Right. And so being able to do the role playing game has, has been a big passion project for him. And so being able to work with a whole lot of different people to bring all that on and make it a big team effort. But now that we have the core mechanics mm-hmm. out and everything there, there's going to be so much more that we're going to be you know, flushing out and kind of getting that ready, which would be, that's the joy of crowdfunding, right? It goes, Hey, here's, here's the game. Here's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and, and we've been able to show off a lot of really cool live plays, you know, with a lot of different people and kind of show off how it's going to be using that Gloomhaven card combat system. But yeah, I mean, it's going to allow people to tell stories within the Gloomhaven universe that they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. And it's, and it is a brand, right? And like, I kind of, there's two questions there, right? You're like, is it a brand? And is it a whole role-playing game thing? And I think what's neat, that we're in a world where Warhammer dominates and D and D dominates yes. and Pokemon dominates and everything else there, but there aren't a lot of really big board game brands that really stand out. Like Asmodee, of course, has like Ticket to Ride and Pandemic yeah, and yeah. everything else, but those are kind of self-contained within their own thing. Mm-hmm. Where and then you know you play the game, you're done. Gloomhaven people that have played Gloomhaven have dedicated like a year or two of their life to this brand. Yes, right, and and. In the tabletop space, I you know, Critical Role is in a similar boat where people that have, that are critters that actively watch that every episode is like four hours long. So if you've watched, you know, Vox Machina or whatever there, like I could I, it, it, in Mighty Nine, and now with with the new stuff, you're you have a lot of your life invested in this story and this world and everything there. And I think with with Gloomhaven, the base. Like it was number one on Board Game Geek for six years. Like you don't do that without having something that's really, really good, right? <laughs> so, and and the the video game being able to be on Nintendo Direct the first week of the campaign was awesome. Yeah, right. Being able to go to consoles is going to be awesome. I can't wait to play Blue Haven on Switch. Like for me, that I think it's like, made. It's be, made for it, isn't it? It's like it reminds 100%. me. It is like kind of like having being able to play Diablo on the switch and things like that it's like being able to play uh, anything like that on kind of like a little handheld on the bus to be able to play gloomhaven on the switch i think it's interesting because it's probably going to introduce a whole level of people who are going to go well where did this come from and it's going to be oh it came from a board game that's the <laughs> that's a kind of a strange and that'll kind of lead them lead in the side but then again it's kind of like you're kind of approaching the thing where you know, if you're wanting role playing game, Seth Lafair, we've got you sorted with a Gloomhaven RPG. If you're wanting something kind of introductory to the Gloomhaven universe, you've got Jaws of the Lion. Um, but then you've got Bugs and Buttons, which sideswiped me, and I wasn't expecting it because I looked at the campaign and I was kind of like, okay, it's big. There's all the minis, so these are this is completionist kind of stuff, and then you announce kind of Bugs and Buttons, so. Had that was that kind of like a special surprise? Was that kind of like something you went, oh, we're just gonna we need to give something to? Oh, we knew about that day one. Like, 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 like that had been, that had been uh, the timing on that dropping was was very planned. Yeah, I'm sure right? it was. And uh, um, and you know, it provide every campaign has a has a drop. Yeah, right. Because it has that thing. Yeah. So how do you find tools? How do you find ways to beat that? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think one of the advantages of the way we've ran this campaign with the drops and the releases and everything there, we've been able to sort of, you know, work to not have to deal with such a big drop in the middle of the campaign because we've been able to have these almost mini launch days, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, for some of these stuff, which has been really cool. So... And do you want to, do you want to give us a little bit about um do you want to like give us a little bit about kind of like the, what we can expect from bugs and buttons or buttons and bugs well so for, so for, for buttons and bugs yeah uh, Nikki Valens and Joe I never say Joe's last name right but like it was it was based off Gloom Holden which Joe had made as a fan passion project he's known in the board game universe for making games small and yeah, solo play yeah, and impacting yeah. all of that and uh you know, being able to license that and bring it into this new brand with Buttons and Bugs is such a cool thing, right? It, and it makes that Gloomhaven mechanic approachable. Mm-hmm. And, and and the solo play board game world is is there, right? And like, there's a two there's a two pronged part, right? One is that people really want to play board games and they're buying all these games, they want to play them, which is great. At the same time, it's really interesting. I think as publishers, we have to realize that we're providing a product that requires people to group play yes and there is a larger audience that is like hey we just want to we want to play a board game like we do a book and we just want to read it and we just want to enjoy it yeah and 
being like Gloomhaven, a lot of base Gloomhaven people have solo played and done those things and done all that. So it's really cool to kind of have this compact, easy setup, easy teardown version of Gloomhaven where you have that itch and you're not mid campaign. You just want to hop in and play a couple rounds of Halo and then hop out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Like buttons and bugs will be able to kind of fit that in a way where you can like, cool, I can play one of these six characters and I've got a 20 campaign mission or 20 campaign missions and just pop through, do my thing. Awesome. You know, and the replayability there is going to be, well, how are you going to get through each one of the different characters and do all those things? There's plenty of options we could do with that. I have no vision into anything beyond this campaign on what Zephyr is doing. Mm-hmm. So we'll see, right? Um, how does it play? How does it play as a game? What what's its kind of like base mechanics for people looking at kind of buttons oh, of bugs for the first time? Because I've heard of Gloomhaven. Well, Gloomhaven is literally you could play Gloomhaven. You can play Gloomhaven on your lap. <laughs> it's the kind of the pitch idea. So for buttons and bugs, what's the kind of the main mechanics? So. Uh, it's not as small as Gloom Holden. Right. You, you have to play it on the table. Uh-huh. But essentially, you're just playing one or two rooms, right? Like, it's it's in its Gloomhaven. It's just Gloomhaven compact, mm-hmm. right? So the AI is a little different for the monsters, and, and but the mechanic play, very, very similar. Uh, so not going to lie, I haven't played it, uh, but I because we only have it on digital, but I've watched a bunch of the digital plays for it, <laughs> and it looks, it's just a Gloomhaven, so, uh, which is cool. You know, so for people that really want to get into that, and obviously, it struck a tone. Like it's, I think it's still number one on board right now. Hold on, let's let's go check. It's it was on there today yeah, as number that. one. It was on there number one. It's let's number go one. live. It's been there since uh, since Sunday. So where I, was it Thursday now? So <laughs> you could just imagine that Brass Birmingham at the moment is walking around, kicking chairs, <laughs> pushing oh, over well, the, and stuff like that. This is just stabbing. just just. A, just on the hotness list, not actually number one, number one, right? It's just yeah, on the hotness list. So. I know, but I mean, it's like must be like, uh, well, I've had enough of this. I've just can't be bothered kind of continually having to look at kind of like Gloomhaven all the time. I'm gonna go and look at something else. Let's look at the hotness, and it's like, ah, oh, it's there as well. Well, I mean, if we're gonna look at the hotness list right now, the top twenty-five is does have Gloomhaven, yeah. Gloomholden, yeah. Frosthaven, <laughs> and Gloomhaven on it, right? So, um, props to Isaac for having it. Oh, and then look at that. And then we got Jaws the Lion at number uh, 37 right here. So, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, you make a good brand, you make a good game, you have a good audience, people want to be a part of it, right? So, and uh, which is fun. I I do have to say it is nice. This is just on a marketing base. It is nice being able to work on games where you don't have to do as much recruitment. Yes. About it, right? Like, it's there's none of this, like, oh my gosh, here's this whole new game, here's this whole new thing. This is much more about just nurturing and fostering a community that's already here, right? And so, a lot of the stuff around what we've been doing is just like, hey, here's cool things, here's cool stuff, here's how you be a part of it, right? So, which is, which is nice. Yeah. And is that, do you prefer kind of fostering a community? as opposed to being the kind of the hunter the hunter gatherer. And the reason I ask this is because the the tabletop games job group kind of continues to grow and that seems to be it's almost a case that if you're looking for a role in the industry, yeah, go and have maybe a look at LinkedIn, but definitely check out the tabletop games group. Because Yeah. I, I mean, that's, I mean, we're talking about things like that. I definitely threw a rock in a pond yesterday when I did my whole post about, hey, you know, you shouldn't uh, work for free at, at cons, right? Like it was a whole thing there, uh, which I thought was interesting. So yeah, but, 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 but like the gaming industry is growing. It's it's good. I, I kind of, I saw that post. I didn't, I, I think I saw it kind of maybe too, in the, too early in the morning before the, the kind of the comments were there. But I, it's really funny because the LinkedIn, the kind of the, there's a kind of a LinkedIn kind of um, kind of almost sphere of kind of influence where people are kind of going, yeah, interns need to get in. It's the summer, so who are you going to be working for? And it's a, what working for free. So I think it's kind of like when you put something like, well, if people are going to be at a con- you know a convention or a conference, um, and if you're working for a publisher, you should kind of get paid. And I can see that rubbing up against the guys that are saying, well, we're looking for somebody to work for six weeks for us for free so they can kind of get some experience. Whereas my view is that if you are, like, you're right, 
I agree with you when you're saying like it's not worth a badge in a it's not worth a badge in a kind of sandwich in a goodie bag with some stuff in it at the end of the day. You've actually got to be kind of paying these paying these people. Well, and what's interesting about that is like I got my start by doing that. I used to be a private press press ganger, yeah. right? And we would get paid with store credit and we'd get four of us in a room and we'd, you know, work Gen Con the full time, mm. you know, like a regular job, running demos, doing tournaments, doing the whole thing. Yeah. But a lot of the press gangers that were doing that were hoping to be part of the inner circle with privateers so they could yeah. get hired and do all that stuff. Yeah. But everything there and being one of the people that was able to get in the inner circle and get hired and do all that like it definitely helped my industry thing but at the same time i look back at that and i was like man that is so exploitive right and it's very different and that's why a lot of those programs went away was because there's a you can look up the emerald city comic-con uh lawsuit with their volunteers and then all that kind of stuff there and that's like a five years ago thing but that essentially gave a lot of these companies pause and they were like okay cool we, we got to get rid of these programs because they're not legal yeah yeah right yeah and 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 now what's happening which is interesting on the facebook side of it linkedin i got like no comments which is fine because i don't like the community is not my jam yeah um they're all pro ai and pro this and that and it's fine. <laughs> it's not, but, it's not uh, <laughs> no but uh but on but on facebook like what's happening is there's a good number of folk that Oh, well, for years I used to not get paid and I'd volunteer because I love the product and I love the game yeah. and I'm just fine having my room covered and my badge covered and it's all good for me. And it's like, okay, person who also works in the industry now, like yeah. that yeah. is not what we should be doing now because yeah. yes, that was how it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Sure. You know, and then everyone's like, oh, well, then, they, then the company has to pay taxes and then we're going to be avoiding doing these services things. And I'm like, look, as somebody that runs the jobs group, there's 15, 20 companies that are posting, hey, we need booth workers for paying. Mm -hmm. Right. So it isn't like this is a backwards thinking here. People want to get good workers and you can still be a board gamer and passionate and I can still pay you 15 bucks an hour for your yeah, time. Yeah. And you're going to work, you know four hour shifts you're going to do four of those at the show and look at that now you've made some money and i've still covered your badge and maybe half your room right and that is yeah i think there's an incentive as well if i if i'm say demoing games and i've got copies of the 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 the, the games i'm demoing next to me and I'm getting paid. I know I'm getting paid for demonstrating it. I think there's also a little bit of, well, this is kind of like a job. So I am demoing. It's not just kind of like an, a gentleman's agreement that we're kind of going through here. And I think it allows you then to say, right, OK, I expect you to at least at the end of every demo, ask them if they'd like to maybe buy a game or look at buying a game or if they've got the game, look at this expansion. I think I think you, you can kind of maybe put, certain kind of maybe obligations on people if you're paying them i think if you're not paying them i think it becomes a kind of like a gray area it's a, it's a weird gray area yeah. right yeah so like i, I for it's it's, it's interesting because right? I, I mean I, I used to run a uh, a convention mm -hmm. right and i and that i didn't pay my friends but also like it was all of us together putting it together and I'd cover our rooms cover our food do all that yeah but that was a different age that was 10 years ago too that was a different thing and uh but like for work for work thing for this like even if i'm bringing my my friends out to work for cephala fair or to work for steam forge or to work for forever you're getting paid because that's how it is people are going to show up on time they're going to treat it like a real job yeah. they're not going to treat it like oh we're hanging out on a cool vacation weekend it's like sometimes they're more prepped than i am like because i'm frazzled with work stuff trying to make sure i can get all the demo materials ready and show up on time and doing this yeah but they're like oh my my three my three buddies who i've brought out yeah put in a room paid for their time are now they're at 8 30 and like hey ross we're here we're ready to work and they're in work mode versus when we finish at the hall at 5 p.m go and get drinks and then they're like "Woo, what a fun day now let's go hang out and do whatever go play a demo yeah yeah yeah, yeah like and you can still enjoy that and do that. And I think what's really interesting about all of that right now is the dichotomy of people that are like, oh, well, I didn't get paid to do that. 
<laughs> and that industry shouldn't change to do all these yeah. things. I got I, I got all these perks. And I, yeah. They covered my room. I should be thankful that that happened. Yeah. It's like, well, cool. That's like that happened to me, too. But like I also realized at the time that like I can't pay my bills and press gear points. You yeah. Know? yeah. And at a certain point, if I already have all the factions, what do well, I need like, a thousand yeah. points yeah. of store credit for? I can't resell it either because then I'm going to feel awkward about that if I if I spend the points to get store to get product and then go resell it, like I'm, I'm not a store. Yeah. So it's just a weird, it's a weird thing, but like most major companies are paying now Asmodee, Renegade, you know, um, steam forged, uh, Hasbro Pokemon, you know, they're, they're doing these things where if you're working for them, you're, you're getting paid for the stuff. Obviously, there are differences when it comes to like doing a retailer event or an organized play thing you've put together yeah, and yeah, all of that. Yeah. So like, and then there's also a difference between, hey, I have a 10 by 10 booth and I'm bringing my buddies to come hang out with me at a local show and we're just going to do yeah, some yeah, stuff yeah, there. Yeah, like, yeah. But like, I feel like that's common sense that but I'm still going to say it because I'm like, oh, no. but it's like, if I'm bringing out 20, 20 people to work my Gen Con booth and I'm expecting them to show up at 830 to work nine o'clock to 5 p.m. to run demos. They're going to get a lunch break. They're going to get food. They're going to do these things. That's a shift for work. Yeah. Right. They're, they're going to have to deal with all the Gen Con attendees. They're going to be running demos. They're going to be selling product essentially. Yeah. Like sure. They aren't manning the freaking the register, but they're still on my booth floor yeah. in my sales space doing stuff or they're at a table DMing, doing a thing. And right now, here I am, I'm like, a, I'm, on, I'm like on a weird like socialist, like we need to pay people thing, power to the labor. But it's just like, it's just like. You look at WG, just, you look at WGA at the moment and it's all about pay and workers' um, rights and stuff like that, you know, you know. And I mean, I was talking to somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were like, oh, Ross, like, what's your work plan? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm contract right now, right? And my last two jobs have been contract, mm-hmm. you know? So like for me, they're like, oh, you've jumped around a lot. And I'm like, well, not really. I've jumped around because. That's the job that I've been doing. They like Steam Forge brought me on for a year and a half. Yeah. That was the contract that I signed. Yeah. Right. They had the option to re up and we just decided not to. Yeah. Right. Like with Steam Forged, I've signed a 12 month a 12 month contract from January to January. Yeah. Right. And so come December, we'll talk and see what's up. Right. And if they decide that, hey, that was really cool. Thanks for doing the campaign. Now that we don't have that much to manage, we're just gonna yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. go back. And if that's the case, baller, right? Like I just, for me, I got paid and I ran one of the biggest, most eyes on camp, even if it didn't raise $14 million or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's still, everybody saw it. Everybody's looking at it going, what was that? Right. And I'll be able to talk about like the craziness that was these things, but I still got paid for my time and all that contracts up there. So it's just interesting, right? Because I think a lot of the talk that is going to be evolving around paying people for their time, a lot of that has bias from people that, Oh well, when I was doing it, yeah, that's, this is how we did it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite. You that's know. one of my favorite things is if if somebody says that uh, when they were when they were younger, when they, when they were your age, and they only you know they only volunteered, didn't get paid, and stood on their feet for eleven hours, and they turned out okay. Um, the truth is, no, you actually didn't turn out okay. If you yeah, think it's somebody fact, else, the fact that you're like the yeah, yeah, the fact that you had to defend it with such like like ferocity, <laughs> yeah. like. It was just I ran demos backwards in the snow <laughs> exactly. and it was all good and we had eight of us in a room and but it was great. I had to carve like, my minis with my teeth and t- you, t- yeah, you didn't even have right? these kind of things. But the other thing is yeah. as well, and the un- the other important thing is, if if I advertise for, say I'm advertising for Jaws of the Lion demonstrators, okay? We're going to play the first two scenarios or the first scenario and two scenarios. I'm going to get you set up. I'm going to show you how to play it. If you say that's a non-paying position, then you're relying on passionate people who love Jaws of the Lion to do it. If you say it's a paid position, then what you actually end up getting is you get people who are demonstrators applying for the job who have done that. And there's a big difference between... You know, and that's what I say. If you're looking for somebody to, or we're looking for an intern who knows about marketing, and we are, you know, whatever company, if you, then you're looking for somebody who's passionate about the company. But if you say, right, we're going to pay you twenty dollars an hour, 
then you're looking for a marketer and you'll actually get somebody who says, look, I've got a year's experience in this or two years experience. I can kind of, kind of come in and kind of help you, which is pretty cool. Um, one of the things that uh, was a bit of a turn was uh, the move from Kickstarter to Backerkit. So, how have you found that with you, obviously, were you knowing your way around Kickstarter? Have the tools, how's the tool set changed? Has it been an awful lot different? Has it been more helpful or is it like comparing kind of apples and seahorses? You know, they're completely different uh, kind of systems. It's, it's interesting, right? Because Kickstarter, people are very trained on Kickstarter. Yes. Right? Like they know that they, they see the post. They're on their phone, yeah. they see the post, they click it, they see what they want, they pick the pledge, mm -hmm. they click yes, I understand, it's not a store, and they're done, right? It's like three, four clicks, you're out, everybody knows what to look for, and they make it happen. Backer Kit does not have the the years on them yeah. on the front facing end. Yeah. Right. Like they, they have, they have primarily been a pledge manager system. I think one of the best pledge manager systems. Um, and they're very good at managing people's pledges and taking them on a, on a marketplace run mm -hmm. to help them through everything there. And so when Isaac was working with backer kit to make this campaign happen, uh, there was a lot of discussion about, Hey, what can we do to not make this Kickstarter 1.5? Right. And not make this 2.0. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we don't just want to have it be pull up, do a thing, do all that. And that wasn't going to happen anyway, because we were going to have like three products at launch and then with a fourth coming halfway through. So you can't just like on Kickstarter, adding any kind of add on or stretch gold or whatever, you have to go and modify your yeah. pledge and do your amount. Yeah. And then you forget about what you've added. So then when, when the campaign's actually over, then you got to go back in and go, okay, cool. I've pledged for yeah. X amount. Now I got to go and re-add what I want. That impulse moment is there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those things change, right? That being said, once the pledge manager opens, then it's like a free, free game again. And then you're like, oh, cool. Now anybody can hop in and do all those things. Uh -huh. no, 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 no. But with this, we have the ability to have that moment happen right away. Yeah. Right. And so Bagger Kit was very responsive, very excited, very, you know, passionate about how can we make this a really good experience. And, you know, I wonder, I wonder what I would have loved to be uh, a fly on their wall after Isaac told them, hey, we're going to do three products on launch. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, uh, if that was what they were ready for. Um, but, it's interesting because I think we've been able to adjust pretty well on that. And if anything, it's been a really cool use of their system mm -hmm. because I don't think any other crowdfunding platform would have been able to handle the festival the way that we've been doing it, right? Because we've got so many different things you can add on and do that. That being said, it's been really interesting to see the path that people have gone on to pledge. And I think the initial launch with the page going down initially because it was just so many people. Yeah. And then there were there were a few days of like, what is this thing, right? And there was a lot of like, I don't know what to back, mm -hmm. what do I do, yeah, everything yeah, yeah. there. And I think part of that was, first off, they were games people hadn't seen before really. So it was like, what even is in second edition? What's in the role-playing game? So there was that shock. But then it was also, how do I navigate this thing? Right. Like it was just, there was so much to absorb and do that. And people are so used to seeing the one game, seeing components, seeing the reviews, yeah. seeing some stuff and having a good idea about it. But this this page was, hey, welcome to this 30 days of stuff you're going to go on. Mm. We're going to drip feed a lot of these things. We've got videos going on. The page is a long scroll. We're going to do this stuff. There's clicking through and everything there. And we, had, we were doing and still are doing updates to the page almost every day just to help with that navigation and that experience and everything there. So if somebody was to go on the page now versus if they hadn't seen the page since launch day, it's a new page, right? A lot of the graphic view is the same and everything there, but now we have a lot of these like guides on like, Hey, do you want this? Do you want this? Oh, are you a role play gamer? Yeah, 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 or are you, yeah. are you doing? And so like that helped um, because it's just, it's that right. And so it's, it's, Backer Kit's been very helpful. They're, they've got stuff people aren't used to. 
there. It's not like in the chat section. It's not one giant. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thing there, so there's threads and all of that, which is, I it has advantages and disadvantages, right? Like, um, but the the discussions parts are cool. You can pull away each of those and make it its own HTML, which is super helpful. You can do those things there, which is great. But we've had to do, you know, uh, updates with them that are, you know, it's just neat. So, so yeah. And did you audition kind of other places or was it a case of, well, this is going to be, this has to be the one? Because I, I think I'm seeing that Kickstarter seemed to be in a kind of a little bit of a back, a kind of like a backpedaling phase. They're kind of very quietly going, um, oh, you know how we talked about blockchain? Yeah, well, you know, I was really drunk and I maybe said some things I shouldn't have and put out a statement about it, but I'm really sorry about it. And do you think, do you think they weren't, I'm not, I, I don't think they were ready for the kind of the backlash. I think they were expecting everybody to kind of jump on it and go, that's kind of cool. So they seem to be kind of backpedaling at the moment. And do you think that's maybe been caused by someone like people like Seth Lafair going, we, um, we're going somewhere I else. don't know. I think that everybody saw the money that was being made with Bitcoin and, and blockchain and everything there. Yeah. And they saw the hype around it and they go, how do we be a part of this? Yeah. And I don't think Kickstarter had thought that through. And I don't think they were aware of the main audience that uses their platform. Yeah. Right. I, I, th- I think there is a disconnect between big tech and the users just in general. Right. And I think they didn't realize that a lot of their indie people and board game people don't like blockchain and don't like this. Right. So, um, I mean, we're literally playing games with cardboard and standees and miniatures. I mean, could you just like, hello Luddites. Would you, would you like to, would you like to be going to the third level of new technology and are like going, no. (laughs) Well, and it wasn't even that. It was just like, it will, well, like, I'm down to hear what you want to do with it. Yes. What does that mean? Yes. Right. And I don't think that ever got explained. No. And they ended up going through a new CEO and all these things and all that. And I look forward to seeing what Kickstarter does because Kickstarter is a leading platform yeah. in our industry. Yeah. They 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 direct a lot of business. I'm sure a third of the of the publishers that are going to be on the floor at Gen Con this year are there because of Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Right. Like there's a lot of that stuff that happens. And so they need to be able to take care of the audience they have created. And it looks like they're going to go that way, you know, and it's just tough because Kickstarter, you know, I'm sure there were investors that were like, yo, we got to get on this blockchain thing. And then they just figured it out. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, that's. I, I have I've a lot of friends right now that are working with blockchain board games and RPGs and shit like that. And uh, they, don't, they don't even know what it's going to do, right? But for a lot of them, they're getting to play around with this, yeah. with this technology and see what it does. And, you know, it's it's on the same boat with like a virtual tabletop and all the AR augmented reality thing. People keep trying and maybe something will stick. Like right now, there's a new Batman game out that has like an AR thing where you're playing through a movie and the pieces have cards that have little holographic things on the table and it makes for like an AR experience thing. And it's like, cool, you know, like, uh, we'll see how that goes, you know? So it's, it's neat, but I can, you know, D D and D is working on their next VTT with like 3d print things and this and all of that and all everything there. So there's definitely a lot of stuff happening in the industry right now. Yeah. That is, that is pushing stuff forward. Uh, but is blockchain and, you know, Bitcoin and all of that stuff going to be part of it? Maybe eventually, but I don't think anybody has a firm idea of what that actually means right now. Yeah. And then with a lot of that being unregulated and then a lot of that stuff being caught for scam and yeah, fraud, yeah. like well, a lot of us are like, yo, like we already put enough risk as is with crowdfunding. Why would I want to put another layer of uncertainty with someone else's company that has no idea who I am. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's like the entrepreneur that goes into the, the shark tank or dragon's den as it's known in the UK and says, you know, 
This is for when you have white shoes and you wear them out in the mud and you need to protect your white shoes. And it's like, okay, but I don't have white shoes. You're kind of looking, you're created a solution for a problem that kind of doesn't exist unless like four or five completely ambiguous things kind of happen all at exactly the same time, which is the way I kind of view blockchain. I've yet to see anybody come up to me and say, it's good and this is the reason why it's good. I've seen a lot of people saying, well, you just don't understand it, therefore you're stupid kind of thing. And it's like, well, that's not exactly a way to kind of, kind of sell sell the product. Um, One thing I have noticed, Mr. Thompson, is that there has been things at, like, say, comic cons and stuff like that, panels and stuff, <laughs> <laughs> where, where they're having to make sure that they reduce the font on somebody's name so his entire name can fit in the little announcement thing. Uh, just so you can fit, because I noticed you've started to appear kind of doing kind of talks at like panels and stuff like that. So how how are you feeling about that? <laughs> yeah, oh man, yeah. So like we, uh, uh, the campaign ends on Wednesday. Yeah. Comic-Con starts Wednesday, <laughs> right? My programming for Comic-Con starts Thursday. Yeah. Right. And then I have like two, like, like two or three days and then I leave for Gen Con. So uh, when I when this, at the beginning of the podcast, when I said I'm in the shit, I mean, like, <laughs> here, here we go. Right. So it is always fun working with Comic-Con. Um, I've worked with them on a big handful of stuff. I normally do panels at WonderCon and Comic-Con and stuff like that, mm. which is great. And it's fun to be able to bring more tabletop programming and do everything there. Comic-Con has had games at it forever yeah. their games division runs all these things and all this stuff i got into tabletop gaming on a professional level because of comic-con yeah uh i got my first demo of war machine at comic-con when private Deer press used to go and then ended up working for them what four years later yeah. right so yeah. um I, i'm very thankful for that and so what's been neat is being able to do more of this stuff so i used to run my own convention in san diego called kingdom con I did that for years and then when that ended Comic-Con was like, hey, uh, you've got free time now, apparently. Um, do you want to do some stuff with us? And so we actually ended up running an event during quarantine called D4, yeah. uh, which is its own like tabletop uh, online thing. We did like 30 panels, discussion stuff, all through their resources online, which was super cool. Uh, and then essentially they were like, oh, cool, Comic-Con is keeping going. So we kept doing panels and stuff like that. I've, I've coordinated five panels. I'm moderating three of them. <laughs> Um, and then I've got another buddy of mine who's moderating a couple of them as well, yeah. which is super great. And then um, the last year and now this year, I've been the, the coordinator for the RPG Play Theater, um, which Comic-Con's given us a ballroom at the Omni Theater right across, or Omni Hotel mm -hmm. right across the street. And we do uh, live plays for RPGs. Uh, it's a big thing. We're seeing a lot more of that now. Obviously, Critical Role was a big thing with that. Yeah. Adventure Zone, Penny Arcade, Acquisitions Inc., all these guys are all doing really cool stuff. And so it's like, cool, let's start getting that going. And so uh, I essentially, like last year, reached out to a bunch of different publishers, and we had some really cool folk do that, like Wizards of the Coast and Hunters Entertainment and stuff like that. So this year we kept that going. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, we've got three games each, you know, with Marvel and Paizo and Catalyst and Modifius and Beetle and Grimm's and Hunter's Entertainment and all these people like that doing different things. And so they're bringing in celebrities and actors and uh, tabletop personalities and all these folk to run games and do that yeah. uh, and provide more offering for Comic-Con, which is cool. And like, and even outside of what I'm doing, like there's people that there's a whole designer's uh, room where people can pitch games and do stuff there. There's a lot more panels that people are putting together with talking about D&D &D and game design and pitching and everything there. So like, while I definitely have like a voice to promote what I'm doing and with the people that I'm doing, there's a lot going on at Comic-Con now, which is great because tabletop is becoming much more mainstream. Yes. Um, so, and gaming has always been there. So it's not like it's like a, it's not a comeback. We've been here for years mm -hmm. kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it's, it's one of those things that's neat, but being, they need folk to help do that because Comic-Con is just going to do whatever Comic-Con does. You've got to bring opportunities to them yeah. and then they'll figure out 
do you want to do yeah. this or not? Yeah. And then another cool thing that I do that I'm not promoting on my main page because everybody and their mama want to go is I'm also running a tabletop game uh, industry gathering at Comic-Con. Uh, and I've been doing that the last couple of years. So I've booked out uh, a brewery, like, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, essentially like down the road from Comic-Con. It's like a five minute Uber. Is this to, and, is this to uh, ultimately answer that question, whether or not you can organize a piss up in a brewery? <laughs> what <do you> <laughs> we well, just... they have, they, they, they... They, they they had non alcoholic drinks too, so it's okay. Right? All right, yeah, but, yeah. But I hear um, that kind of that's phrasing because I couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery. It's like, well, I'm going to just prove to you I can, so I got to put it on your CV. Um, is this a and speaking of CV, is this all the stuff that you're doing? Because you don't seem to be. Yes, you're focused on what you're doing at Cephal Fair just now, but you still seem to have your kind of your fingers in multiple kind of pies. Yeah, I mean, you could probably say like my industry work life balance is really bad, mm. right? Like I, <laughs> so yeah, all the comic con stuff, I just do it. Like, there's no payment, there's no any of that. Mm. Um, it's just, uh, it's just fun to make happen, right? So, um, which is cool. So, are you starting to get kind of offers? Do you have kind of like you know we gotta catch up for a drink, Ross? Come on, I'll see, I'll see, and you get like people who like you'd pass in the corridor and you go, "Hi, remember oh. we're cousins." And now they're kind of like, yeah, come on, let's cut, grab five minutes and a coffee and, and let's talk about what you're doing all, and where you're going. All the time. And it's it's it's, it's happened a lot more in the, like, this year mm. has been a lot of that. Like, I, th- I think I've always had a little bit of, hey, what's up, what are you doing? Mm. How can we help out? And yeah. there. But this year is definitely rubbed up. And I feel really bad because like right now I've got like literally like four messages that came over last night. <laughs> They're like, hey, we're going to be at Comic-Con Gen Con. We just want to talk and catch up. And I'm like, <laughs> my brain space is literally like <laughs> not there, you yeah. know, because it's like someone was like, oh, can we like, I feel bad because like I, ha- I haven't even done my normal Gen Con marketing blasts and stuff like that because it's just like, um, I've been doing the campaign. But I'm guessing, <laughs> you know? I mean, like, but I'm guessing Seth Lafayre is going to yeah. be there. I mean, Seth Lafayre's going to yeah. be at Gen Con, but... Seth Lafayre's going to be at Comic-Con, too. But so do you need to... I mean, do you... Have you reached... Have you reached... I mean, are you at the point where you're kind of like... Uh, and don't take this the wrong way. But are you at the point where you're kind of like the Pepsi and Coca-Cola kind of levels? Never. Where you're kind of like, we still... We just need to... We're continually having to remind people that we exist, that we're in the forefront... Yes, we're in the hotness. Yes, we're at the you know the top ten of BGG. However, we just need to continually kind of nudge you just to remind you that we're there and we're available. And it's kind of never right. Mattel still promotes Uno. Yes, I know that. Yeah, which is my you know? yeah, yeah, which is yeah, which is which is. I'm wondering. Yeah, I guess you're still kind of going out there. So I guess you always got to go. It. There are so many people that are playing games and discovering games for the first time. Mm-hmm that want to do things that you can never ever get lazy and rest on your laurels because like look at warhammer look at games workshop right like 10th edition man like they are promoting like a mad and you're like oh everybody plays warhammer why are they promoting and i'm like i've gotten i've been getting messages from people that are like oh hey i i bought this leviathan box yeah. thing like I, I want to get into warhammer can we play and i'm like look at that Right, and it's because it's approachable, it's fun, yeah. it looks neat, yeah. right? And if they were just like, oh, we're Warhammer, we'll just do the normal, maybe they wouldn't be as big as they are, right? And like D&D's in a similar boat. They're like, so you're never, never get lazy, right? But at the same time, you don't have to blitz, blast everything. There is there is like a nice retention recruitment kind of vibe you, pl- you can hit um but you'd always 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 be hustling right mm-hmm. like but in a way that, that makes sense so i think for gloomhaven obviously people are going to come by the camp people are going to come by the booth at Gen Con, mm-hmm. and they're going to go oh my gosh mm-hmm. and we're going to have demos of the rpg and the buttons and bugs and of uh second edition show off like those they're all going to be there they're going to come see it i i think it's more of a when i say that i haven't been prepped it's more of a me thing 
right? Like I like being <laughs> at Gen Con with yeah. meetings lined up and all these things and all of that, but I literally just haven't had the bandwidth to do it, you know, like in, it's just funny because it's like normally it'd be like, let's do it. But right now, like I've been, we still have six days to go for the campaign and I'm still getting stuff coordinated there and doing all of that. And the last three days of that's going to be intense. And so it's just timing, you know, it's just funny how that all works out. So, um, will you be able to take, take will you be able to take like half a day out to crash and just kind of, cause are you approaching the what? level where you're kind of like, I don't need any more coffee because I've... I mean, that was this morning. <laughs> I woke up and I was like, I mean, I, I fought in armor last... Ugh, I was at the... <laughs> this is a dumb story you're going to yeah. get. Uh, I've been at, in this chair working on this straight for months. Yeah. Right. And uh, in the last week, I was like, I need to go be more social. So like, I went to a house party like last Saturday. And like, I went to... I hang out with some friends at the mall and see, I saw a movie, which was great. And then uh, I was at a bar last night after fighter practice and um, I don't drink, but they have any beers, right? Yeah. So I'm hanging out with some friends and one of my like high school friends with there and I haven't seen her for years. And she like sat down and like started talking to me for a little bit. And I realized I didn't have anything to say that wasn't working. <laughs> And I was, and she, and I, I, she, I got it. She's like, cool, it's going to catch up later. And I'm like, man, I really like, and I normally have, like, I'm, I don't think I'm charming, right? And I'm not going to say all these things and that kind of stuff. But also, like, it was like 1130 and I just finished fighter practice and it was like a long yeah. thing, and I, you know, and I was just like, and I was like, this morning I woke up and I was like, how did that conversation end? Did she just get up and did leave she, or did like, did, she, did I, because like I was, but like, and I was, I was paying the bill to leave because my buddy had just yeah, left. Yeah. I was paying the bill and she came up. Yeah. And so like, I think I was, like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm going to go get a burrito and leave. And then she sits down and I was like, oh my gosh, hey, it's so good to see you. And I'm just like, my brain was like, pay receipt, get in car, get burrito, go home. Yeah. Like, I don't think I ever had that like, oh, hey, talk to pretty girl and tell her how your life is going and i think i did and i was just like oh yeah i've been working on this game thing and then i've got two more game things for the next month you know that isn't like a hey let's go hang out on a date next week it was just funny like i'm not even mad at myself for it i'm just like how <laughs> like where's where's the break gonna happen right and so in my life um i i got a condo yeah. uh i'll be moving into i'll be moving into in september mm. Um, so that'd be really cool. Mm. And then I think I'll be able to kind of like get my life back and plugged in a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think I've been so well, at least like to a point where I'm not, you know, living in, you know, like my bedroom, uh, and doing my stuff and have my stuff in storage and everything there. I'll be able to be like, great, let's now take all these things I've had in storage and make my own space and do my own things and then figure out, you know, how to take care of myself better. Um, did you check so. did you check how many things she pledged for <laughs> so, <laughs> she's, she's not a gamer but it's funny because she did bring up like a gamer thing right and she was like oh ross whenever i see you i think of warhammer and my best friend nick plays warhammer and the whole thing there and i'm just like how funny how funny is that so uh yeah i mean it's 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 whatever like it's just one of those things where like for a while i used to joke that i was kind of like doctor who because uh i would only appear at like <laughs> moments in time like events or something right like I, I would never just be like be there to play super smash yeah. it's always like oh there's a thing happening i'm at an event i'm at a thing you know so uh yeah you know it's just uh so campaign finishes we'll make sure we put links into the show notes so we've got kind of like notes to show what kind of game what kind of game would you like to be involved in next what kind of genre because you've done big You've done Steamforge and Elden Ring and now you're doing Seth Lafayre. So if somebody, if I, if I was like, I don't know, the semi-god of opportunity or the demigod of opportunity and said, right, okay, you can, I'm going to just let you, the campaign is going to be a success. Regardless of the platform or the genre of the type of game. But what you get to do is you get to run a campaign for a particular type of game, regardless of the type of game. What kind of game would you like to run a campaign for? So for me, it's not about the game. Mm -hmm. It's about 
the brand. Mm. It's about the people behind the game and it's about the community. Right. Right. So, um, I mean, the game's got to be good mm -hmm. too, to some level. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to be peddling crap. Um, but, um, I like working with people that are passionate. Yeah. I like working with brands that are exciting. Yes. I like working with companies that are going somewhere. Yes. Right. And for me, that's a big thing. And I think we should all want that. Right. Like we should want to be a part of things that are that excite us. Yes. That are that, that, that make us passionate to show up to do the thing we're paid to do. And then working with people that we care about and that have similar beliefs as us. Right. Yeah. So um, for me, that's I'm when I do interviews and when I do stuff like that, I'm it's also like, hey, what are you guys looking for as a company like what what where does where do you see this going kind of thing having worked at the range of places i have and the games that i've done um i think i'd like this is like, silly but like i'd like to work at a company that could pay my health insurance <laughs> and then i'd like to work at a company where i can be part of a team that is like on a marketing team yeah where we're all doing that covid totally screwed the office environment Right. Yeah. And I think for a while and now, like we've all been in, we've all been working from home, doing those things. No one's really going back to the office unless you have to. And I don't miss the office environment, but I do miss a marketing team where I'm not the only one putting in the ideas for it. And obviously with Step Affair, Isaac and Price and everybody else, they had their thoughts. And yeah, 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 there, yeah. All of that. So I could sell like it was just me coming up with the stuff, but. I like working with teams and collaborating and doing all of that stuff. I don't like when it's just the Ross show, right? And doing all that kind of stuff. So it's nice to be able to collaborate and do all that. So I know it's a different answer than what you were doing. That being said, like I love uh, miniatures, I love role playing games, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, obviously, if I can work on a game that's, you know, lots of cool miniatures or uh, really cool storytelling stuff and, and cool mechanics i'll take it but i think we're also at a point where you don't gotta throw a rock too far to get that um there are yeah. a lot of yeah there are a lot of companies that are that are doing that and a lot of companies that need people that are experienced promoting those sort of things yeah um which is which is nice uh so it's just kind of cool to see what we'll see right like um i'm always I don't, I don't say, I don't say I'm always looking because that's that's not the right phrase. But I'm always excited to see what the next adventure is, yeah. right? And so, like, if if I get reapped again, awesome, yeah. right? And then we'll do the we'll do the pledge manager and get that all fleshed out. Yeah. And over the next two years, work on promoting everything going on because this campaign has five windows of shipping, <laughs> so it's going to be um, five waves of getting it all out and doing everything there and that's that's going to be a whole journey in itself right on top of frost haven going into retail on top of you know uh jaws of the lion and everything else they got going on so like that awesome right but also at the same time if not then who knows you know like even if i was to find myself at a company that cranks out games every month right and does all those things i don't mind that as long as i'm working with people that are cool and the company is, you know, caring about the community and the, and the people that they support. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm kind of, do you know who's exciting me at the moment? Who's that? Funko and Prospero Hall. Oh. I've been playing. They've got a lot of really cool stuff. I've been playing a few of them games recently. And, and, you know, I was just like, I was like, you know, I was like, damn, you know, because I played Pan Am. And I was like, Pan Am's great, what? isn't it? And then, oh, yeah. know, and then I, I was playing, um, and then I played the Indiana Jones Sands of Adventure, the real, the real time. And I was like, okay, I see, I see where we're going with this. And then I've got um, Big Boss as well, which is the yeah. Wolfgang Kramer old game. And I'm just like going, yeah, yeah. you, you guys, are, I've seen they've got this new um, Star Wars. I think Star Wars Rivals or something like that that's coming out as well. Right. But it's the Prospero, it's the Prospero Hall kind of team, and I'm kind of like, I would like to. I spoke to um, was it Fertessa Elise, ages and ages yeah, ago. Yeah, Fertessa, and she's now at Pokemon. And do you know what? I that makes me so happy to know 
that she's working oh, at yeah. Pokemon because she, you know as a as a game designer for that the card is game, so right? amazing. I'm so oh, it's so be excited because yeah, that's gonna yeah, yeah, it's totally. gonna be good for Pokemon as well because she, she knew her stuff. She knew what she was doing. They, so that was excellent. They, they're good. yeah. It totally did. so it's brilliant brilliant yeah but, yeah, but, yeah but, but i mean like the whole prospero hall team those guys they've got a really good team mm. and they are uh the amount of games they're able to put out that are that are, that are cool is very exciting right so yeah they're gonna be comic con they're gonna be a gen con um they're gonna have a whole promotion thing i just helped them line up some stuff uh for <laughs> of course you people. did <laughs> I, 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 it's with San Diego, it's I'm local, right? Yeah. So it's like, hey Ross, do you have a small army we can tap into to do a thing? It's like, yeah, yes, right. So uh, there you go, which is fun. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 yeah, Foco's doing cool stuff. I um, it's it's gonna be neat. We'll see. There's so many companies that are doing neat things, right? So it's kind of like it's just figuring out what's uh what's gonna be next, exactly. you know? So exactly, right. I'm going to draw a line under this conversation, Mr. Thompson, because I believe we have at, had, right? a, you know, I mean, I was like, like a, you know, how do we talk? We talked last time for over an hour. How do we manage to get talking for over an hour again? And there we go. You know, and I know you're you a busy go. man. You got stuff to do and things like that. So I'm going to say just a couple of things. Thank you very, very much for guesting on the show. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate you and your insight into the industry. And it's nice that we talked to the stuff on the side, which I, I really, really enjoyed. Um, I'll make sure that all the links for the Gloomhaven Festival go into the show notes. And uh, there's only two more things to do. We know Ross isn't a wizard, he said last time. It's all good. But it's a time for him to say goodbye. So say goodbye, Ross. Uh, thank you so much for having me on and dealing with the scheduling. I know we had, we had a couple of hiccups ah, on that getting so, going, so but I'm, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to come. It's always great to talk and do all these things, um, which is great. If you want to find me, yes. uh, almost Kirk almost on Kirk. Twitter and Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn as Ross Thompson. I'm on Facebook as Ross Thompson. Uh, currently for some of our games, we are running the Gloomhaven Grand Festival on Backer Kit, which will be live for six more days as of when this was filmed and recorded, um, but then, of course, the pledge manager will be open a little bit after, and that you'll be able to pledge for each wave as it comes up on shipping. So, don't feel like you've uh, you've you know like missed out. You still have plenty of opportunity plenty to do all that. Time. And uh, you, if you go on the our YouTube for Fair Games, you can see all the cool stuff we've been doing with gameplays and interviews and everything there. And uh, yeah, it's just gonna be gonna be neat. So. Uh, it's always fun to work on this stuff and I'm glad that I can come on and talk about it. Awesome. And it's a goodbye from me. <laughs> yeah, everybody have a, have have a, a good have rest a good of your day, day and uh, play some games, right? So Okay. And uh, three, two, one, say goodbye. Three, two, one, goodbye! Bye. A wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Mm-hmm.